Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Stephanie Lee and I'm a psychologist at the Child Mind Institute. We're a national nonprofit that supports children and families with gold standard mental health care, advice and resources all online and accessible to everyone. During the coronavirus crisis, our telehealth resources include diagnosis and treatment of mental health and learning disorders, 30 minute phone consultations, bereavement and grief support, remote neuropsychological evaluation, and that's honestly just a sampling of the resources that we can offer. Please, please, please visit childmind.org slash telehealth to learn more. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about starting on the right foot, um, how to increase your chances of getting desired behavior from your behaviors from your kids. Um, I'm going to answer questions about this topic and about anything else that you're wondering about. So please, please, please post your questions in the feed um, and we'll post links to helpful resources on childmind.org throughout. Remember, we're here every day and we look through your questions daily. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with um, some of the questions that we've had from previous uh, Facebook Lives that were surrounding this topic. And so the first one I'm going to start with is, what can I do to make my toddler more willing to follow rules and limits around bedtime? It's a really, really great question. And um, you know, a, a one that I think many, many parents and caregivers are struggling with. Um, that's actually a very common question pre-COVID or, or pre-crisis as well. So um, getting kids to follow directions around a time that can be stressful for many families, particularly families who might be out of routine, um, you know, is, is a really valid concern. I'd say that the very first thing that you wanna do is make sure that you're organized or have an idea of what you'd like that bedtime routine to be before you attempt to implement that with your child. So maybe sitting down with your partner or with um, an older sibling or maybe just on your own to think a little bit about what, what are the sequence of events that need to happen in the evening? How do you want them to flow ideally? And is it possible for you to structure your evening in that way? I also think it can be incredibly valuable and useful, particularly for young children like toddlers, to provide a visual support or a visual schedule that kind of goes along with the structure or organized way that you're attempting to implement that routine. The schedule doesn't have to have a lot of words, and honestly, it doesn't need to have a lot of pictures or be super fancy. What it can be is just a simple indication for your child the order of events that they're going to follow in order to kind of get them to bunker down and into that bed. I also think it's incredibly important to think a little bit about when your child is typically falling asleep already, because if you're attempting to implement your bedtime routine an hour, multiple hours before your child is actually falling asleep on average, you'll be working against them or against their bodies when they're kind of at their physical best um, and are gonna have the most energy to kind of fight that routine. So what we wanna look at is finding a time when kids are already relatively tired. And if that means pushing back your bedtime routine to meet them in that area, at least temporarily, before you move the time, the bedtime back to an ideal time, um, that's okay, right? But we want to try to work with our body's natural tendencies and rhythms to be falling asleep. So um, what we kind of say is that good sleepers fall asleep within 15 minutes of being in their bed on average and any amount of time that your child is in bed or your teen is in bed or for instance you are in bed as an adult past 15 minutes you're actually just teaching your body how not to sleep in your bed so you really want to do everything in your power to make sure that you're working again with those natural rhythms um, and making sure too that your children are getting up in the morning at the time that you desire them to get up because what we know is that kids Kids can get makeup sleep either in the morning or possibly if they're extending their naps in the day. So when you're thinking about bedtime routine, you really want to be thinking about sleep hygiene in a very expansive way thinking a lot about when your kid is falling asleep, when they're waking up and any additional nap or sleep time that they might get in the middle. 
Lastly, I would say in relation to the routine, the bedtime routine, let's say you do get a good schedule going and you do have a good visual going, it doesn't necessarily mean your child's immediately just going to follow the, the, the visual or follow the schedule. So you want to use a lot of direct and clear commands around bedtime. You want to make sure that you're providing a lot of praise and reinforcement for desired behaviors, making sure that kids do, particularly a toddler, feels acknowledged for their good behaviors and for their following of the routine, possibly using a reward like an extra bedtime um, uh, a, a be an extra bedtime story or the opportunity for extra cuddles um, before bed as a reward if your child has followed the routine or been consistent with um, the directions that you're providing at bedtime. So hopefully that gives you just a, a little bit of a place to start. Um, and again, be kind to yourself, be reasonable. Um, all parents are struggling with that time in the evening. So you do want to make sure that your expectations for the evening routine aren't too high. If every Everybody does eventually get into their beds and falls asleep. You want to count that as a win. And if you are able to get it closer to the ideal routine across time and trending in the right direction, absolutely, you're, you're, you're doing better than most. So great, great question. And hopefully that's helpful to you in terms of wrangling those toddlers around bedtime. Definitely challenging. Um, another question that we had in the feed previously related to kind of starting on the right foot or how to get these increased uh, desired behaviors is um, how can I get my teenage son to get him to be more helpful around the house or how do I get him to engage a little bit more in chores or the tasks that he needs to complete for us? Um, so a really great question. Again, one that caregivers struggled with a bit before COVID times, um, but I think has been compounded by or exacerbated by the stressful situation that many fam families and caregivers are in right now and currently. I think teenagers, no matter what, are a little bit challenging to motivate. And so you do want to think about what is actually motivating to your teenager. Is it tangibles like an iPad, extra activity time, maybe some cash that they're going to use for the Starbucks that's hopefully going to open up on the corner someday? Um, or is your child a lot more in tune, your teenager a lot more in tune to time with you, attention from you, an opportunity to play a special game or an opportunity to stay up a little bit later or an opportunity to do something social with their friends that they need you for in terms of Zoom or something like that. So first you want to think of maybe your teen is motivated by getting out of things, right? So maybe the best way to motivate them to do the chores you need them to do is to let them out of some of those chores if they do successfully complete the chores in the time frame that you need them to or without prompting or without asking. Um, so you want to think what is motivating to my teenager and then and how do I set the stage or how do I set things up where there's a reward and consequence system in place that rewards them for completing these tasks in an appropriate way and consequences if they're not if they aren't able to complete those tasks. Again, being reasonable and manageable, considering the fact that we are all a little bit more stressed and, and finding it a little bit more challenging to activate these days. I think it's also important to talk with your teenage son about these things, not in the context of the demand. So if you're already saying, please take out the garbage, or why didn't you take out the garbage today? It's probably not the best time to, it's not a teachable moment. It's probably not the best time to have this long conversation with your teenager about responsibility. And realistically, if you're having a long lecture at that moment, the only thing you are allowing is a little escape or delay from actually taking out the garbage, right? So you want to get your kids activated, get your teenager moving and grooving on that right away. And we do want to make sure that we're acknowledging them when they do follow directions right away or they do complete their chores, possibly without asking. Make a big deal out of it. Um, I think that a lot of um, I think that a lot of the Facebook lives that I've done previously, I've talked about praise and the importance of praise and, and acknowledging good behaviors. I've talked about the two types of praise, that there's general praise, things like thank you, good job, way to go, high five. And then there's labeled praise, literally telling someone what it is about their behavior you like. So thanks for completing your chores right away without me asking, or I love how you took out the garbage without me even noticing. It's so, so helpful when you do that. Um, so I think of really making sure that you're acknowledging your child for doing those things being really clear about the expectations as well. They might need some type of visual chore chart or um, visual way of, of 
of you being clear about what the expectations or chores are each day. So hopefully again, that gives you just a little bit of an idea um, and, and it can be helpful for you. Um, all right. So just a reminder, if you're just tuning in, my name is Dr. Stephanie Lee and I'm a part of the Child Mind Institute. And we're talking today about setting the stage for good behaviors, obtaining desired behaviors from your toddlers, teens, and adolescents. And please continue to drop any questions that you might have about this topic or other topics about telehealth in the, in the feed. So thanks, Jen, for your question. I hear that my son, uh, summer camp is closed for the first part of the summer. How can I keep him busy? He is so sad. And it sounds like your son is 10 years old. Well, Jen, thank you so much for that question and for tuning in. I'm so sorry that your son is gonna be going through that disappointment. And I imagine that that's disappointing for the whole family overall. When kids are disappointed, we do want to use the two E's, which I've stolen from Philip Kendall's coping cat, which is a manualized treatment for children with anxiety, right? We want to be empathic and encouraging. So we want to make sure that we validate our child's experience of their disappointment. So when they're saying things like, I'm disappointed, I'm upset about this, we validate them. We really empathize with them. We hear them and let them know we're disappointed too. And, and, and their feelings are natural and normal. We want to also then move on to the second E, which is the encouragement, right, where we're talking a little bit more about the excitement that we can um, kind of conjure up around alternative plans or modified ways that you um, might look at keeping him busy, right? So one thing that um, I certainly would ask, would, would have you kind of take a look at is that the Child Mind Institute is looking at adapting our previous uh, summer program, our therapeutic program that we ran in person um, to a, a telehealth or a, a virtual um, system. So please stay tuned for that. So we might have some ideas for you within Child Mind about ways to, to keep your 10 year old busy. Additionally, I think it's important to start investigating now things that might be able to be helpful to your son across the summer. So thinking about investigating other social skills groups or possibly even looking at creating a group with some peers that might be a regular check-in or a consistent um, social opportunity throughout the summer. Maybe you end up having a Monday lunch group or a Friday, um, you know, morning meeting or something like that with a set of your son's peers so that he can stay regularly connected. Um, I think it's also um, really important to think a little bit about um, what types of physical activities might be possible at that point. So kind of based on where you are and where you're quarantining, is there um, physical activities that you can incorporate into the day in a consistent way, like a go noodle break or relay races or um, thinking about a scavenger hunt that you might be able to create inside the house. And all of these things do take a little bit of time. Luckily, you're kind of aware of this ahead of time. And so you might be able to start to devote just five or 10 minutes a day or maybe even on the weekends to this type of planning to be able to be thinking ahead about these types of activities. Um, we certainly, again, also encourage you to look at the additional telehealth and, and resources that we have on childmind.org. I know that just even in the city, there's been a lot of movement towards, um, you know, Broadway actors being able to um, read stories to kids while they're, you know, have some free time. I know that um, Brooklyn Lab, um, uh, gaming uh, uh, um, organization has been putting out some free classes and resources like that. So I think we are going to have to try to get as creative as we possibly can, even supplementing with things within the family, like a family game night or a family um, uh, game day, where maybe it is about kind of uh, being able to play some fun stuff in a mini pool or even doing some fun bath play or, um, you know, shaving cream play. So thinking about arts and crafts, Think also, is there something that you might be able to do as a family that might kind of develop across the summer? So maybe a garden or thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, looking into an ant farm or something, if you can tolerate something like that in your house, right? So thinking about things that might be able to kind of develop, like I said, throughout the summer and give kids and, and your 10 year old something else to look forward to. And hopefully that camp will open up for him in the second half. So it uh, looks like we have another question here uh, from Susanna saying, um, online school is making my daughter addicted to screens and electronic devices help. 
Well, it's a really, really challenging question, right? And a really challenging um, time that we're in, in that we are reliant on screens and electronic devices for a lot of our social opportunities, academic opportunities, and really a lot of our work opportunities at this point. And at the same time, we do want to make sure that kids are balancing physical activity, nutrition, sleep, hygiene in a healthy way. Um, it's very challenging right now to actually to to um, to help your child with that type of balance. And so I do think that one very important thing is to talk directly with your child if she's old enough um, in a developmentally appropriate way about your concerns. Um, and then thinking about maybe pos maybe making a schedule for your daughter that, imp that, um, that inserts non-electronic or preferred um, activities that don't have to do with screens in into her schedule in a really consistent and routine way. So when we tell kids not to do something, we almost always need to tell them what to be doing instead. And so we wanna make sure that we're thinking possibly even about an activity menu that you develop with her that has a list of preferred activities that don't have to do with electronics that she can go to when she's feeling bored or maybe overwhelmed. And if that's kind of her go-to is, is to go to an iPad or an electronic device at that point. So this is a really good question. And I think, you know, it is hard to put limits on things when we know that kids need these things for academics, but parents should feel free to put limits on screens and electronics, even in the midst of the current circumstances, if they need to, in order to make sure that there is a healthy balance for their children. So it looks like uh, we've got another question coming in. Thanks for keeping these rolling, guys. Uh, Gloria, thanks for your question, and says that you have my four-year-old grandson was upset and told my daughter he was afraid he might forget hug me and give me the virus. Um, how do you talk to preschoolers regarding their fear? Well, Gloria, that's a, that's a really touching question. And I really, you know, I very much appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing that, right? It sounds like your four-year-old grandson has a really, really empathic heart and is really thinking hard about these things in a serious way. And we want to praise him for sharing that his feelings and his concerns. We always want to use our labeled praise in that moment to say, thanks for telling me about what you were thinking, or I love when you share with me your feelings because I can help you, or I can think about those things too. So the very first thing, again, we want to praise your grandson for sharing that information and for his kind, kind heart. Secondly, we do want to make sure that we're letting young kids know, particularly preschoolers or kids that we know are developmentally not in an age where they can completely understand or conceptualize truly what's going on. We want to make sure that we're explaining it to them in a way that does feel developmentally appropriate, comfortable, and safe. So remind your four-year-old grandson that I appreciate that you're thinking about those things. I also want you to know that those are adult worries or things that the adults are going to be in charge of as soon as we do see grandma. So you're not going to be the one in charge of remembering who hugs who. We're going to go over that ahead of time. We're going to make sure that we remind you and help you to think about how to keep yourself safe and grandma safe in those moments. OK, we also do want to make sure that your grandson does understand that all of the adults actually in the United States and in the world at this point are truly in thinking about these things. And it is up to the adults to figure out solutions, not the kids. So. Again, we do want to make sure that he's praised for thinking about these things. And again, having that kind heart, we also want to remind him that Adult worries are for adults to think about, and we're going to help and support you and do our very best to keep you safe and healthy as things progress and as these processes continue. Great, great question, Gloria, and I, I'm really excited and, and hopeful that you're able to, to give your grandson a hug sooner rather than later for sure. Good question. So again, if you're just tuning in, my name is Dr. Stephanie Lee. This is the Child Mind Institute, and I'm answering questions um, in the live feed and from previous feeds about how to set the stage for good behavior, how to get the desired behaviors that you're looking for out of your toddlers and uh, young kids and teens. So um, we have a question from the previous, uh, one of the previous times here. Um, 
any advice, any advice on how to get my ADHD kid to calm down and listen would be amazing. Great, great question. And, and again, you're not alone. As the senior director of the ADHD and Behavior Disorder Center, this is something that we are talking about and managing for parents and caregivers quite a bit. Um, I can certainly, again, kind of point you to some of our telehealth resources and supports and services at childmind.org. Um, and certainly can talk even a little bit more about the way telehealth um, within our center works. We're actually even able to, in, in certain circumstances, live coach parents within their home. So kind of using some Bugineer technology and, and using kind of our, our um, Zoom and team formatting, we're actually able to observe your child's live behavior and to coach you through incidences of behavior um, the best that we can. So I would say if you're having a child, you, if you have a child with ADHD and, and you're available for those resources, give us a look. In addition, I would say that the very best thing that you do want to do when a child is kind of, you know, overly impulsive or um, has a lot of time keeping their body still is you want to make sure that you are incorporating movement breaks frequently and consistently in their day. So again, maybe going back to your go noodle breaks, making sure you're thinking about ways to maybe have them run the stairs if you can't go outside, um, maybe, um, Again, maybe doing some Nike Pro uh, uh, workouts or things like that that we know are going to kind of keep them busy and give them that 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 um, that opportunity to get their uh, their energy out. In addition, we want to make sure that when kids are keeping their body still, when they are being calm and, and, and really concentrating, that we're doing things to encourage it. So if you've seen any of my Facebook lives before, you know I'm going to say labeled praise it, right? So you know I'm going to say when your child does stay in one place or does show a calm body that you're using language, thanks for keeping your body still. I love the way that you stayed at the table. Thanks for coming to dinner so quickly right when I asked. In addition, we can use things like behavior descriptions, which are not a typical way that parents interact with their children, which I'll describe in just a second, to actually increase their attention and concentration. So behavior descriptions are literally telling your child what they're doing. So it's being a, a sportscaster, if you will, of their hands. So you're picking up the red block, you're putting the yellow one on top of the red one. I see that you're building a train track here. The more you describe your child's behavior Behavior, their appropriate and calm behaviors, the more you will actually see those behaviors and the longer your child will actually attend to things. So behavior descriptions, labeled praise, clear structure and expectations, those are all things that will hopefully set the stage for a little bit more of a calm body, a little bit more of, of a calm child. Great, great question. Um, so I think we have a, another question here, maybe our last question in the feed here. Um, so thanks so much, Vanessa, for, for tuning in. Vanessa asks, what are some positive reinforcements for an eight-year-old girl who is getting tired of distance learning? Well, first and foremost, you can validate her because I think she's not alone and many, many uh, children and adults are, are kind of getting sick of this distance learning or distance working thing. Um, that being said, it doesn't sound like it's going away anytime soon. And so we do need to be realistic and forthcoming with your daughter about, you know, how important it is that she remain on task and remain concentrated from her work from home or her social distance learning. So reinforcement can come from a lot of different areas. And I do think in this day and age, in this current circumstance, we do need to think creatively. So kind of going back to the thing I said before about creating a reward menu where you possibly have a number of different novel ideas on there um, that you can offer at different times. And I would think about things like being able to stay up a little bit later, being able to choose what you have for dinner, um, thinking about maybe some apps that your child plays on that you might be able to get the advertisements off for them or make it a little bit more fun for them to play those games. An eight-year-old is also, again, going to be very invested in your attention and your time. So putting things on there like building a fort with you, doing a special cooking lesson with you, having your nails done with mom, um, or dad or those types of things are again gonna be um, maybe one-on-one -on -one opportunities if she has a sibling. So you kind of keep the siblings out and she gets a little bit one-on-one -on -one time. Being able to choose the family game that you play on a game night. Um, these are all things I think that we can use to reinforce kids. 
also thinking again about what I went, went, uh, was saying about kind of in upcoming ideas for the summer. Is your child interested in starting a mini garden? Is your child interested in thinking, you know, figuring out how a butterfly comes from a moth? Those are all things that we can maybe even give your eight-year-old token towards earning, right? So if you're not willing to, to buy the full aquarium right now, you might be able to give her a token towards the aquarium, a token towards the rocks in the aquarium, a token towards a, a fish in that aquarium, and eventually she would be able to earn that aquarium or, or something again into that nature. So thinking about ways to uh, meet your daughter where she's at and, and think again about the things that are most potent to her, right? So I think it's also to, incredibly important to think a little bit about, as I said, what motivates your child specifically. Reinforcement or reinforcers are things that are we are actually willing to work for. And I want to be clear, I love kids and families, but I really only work for money. If Child Mind Institute decided, you know, next week they were going to start paying me in chocolate, I like chocolate, but I probably won't work for it. So you want to think about things on this reward menu that are the cash, not the chocolate, right? So you want to think about things that your eight-year-old is actually invested in really motivated to have because we know the potency of those things is, is going to be high and, and that's when we're going to get the best results the reward menu part also plays into the novelty aspect and the fact that then your daughter hopefully won't satiate on any one of these rewards or your ability to then maybe intermittently um put new rewards in there or um you know, revisit that that reward menu with her maybe weekly to figure out if there's anything new that she'd like to earn. When you have a particularly young kid too, between that like five and eight year old range, remember that kids are motivated by very small things. So I'm gonna give the example. I have a child right now that I'm working with who's in the six to seven year old range and they follow a bedtime routine based strictly on their opportunity to have a teddy bear breakfast in the morning. And teddy bear breakfast in the morning is actually just them sitting on the floor instead of sitting at the table on towels and bringing their teddy bears to the breakfast. So remember that there might be small ways that your, that your family can modify or adapt their behavior, but that will be meaningful to your child in a really creative and fun way. Um, so, you know, think outside of the box as much as you possibly can there and be as creative as you possibly can. Great, great questions. So thank you all so much for your um, for your questions today, for your vulnerability and you're willing to be, you know, so candid about the ways that you're struggling. Um, I think that it helps not just you, but other families as well. So thank you all just again for your willingness here. Um, in conclusion, I want to thank you for joining me, and I very much hope that this was helpful. Remember, we're here every day, and we look through your questions daily. The Child Mind Institute is here to help with the mental health and parenting needs of this coronavirus crisis, no matter where you are. So please, please visit childmind.org telehealth to learn more about the incredible variety of remote telehealth resources we have available during this time for children, teens, young adults. Um, please, please, please be safe and stay well. Thanks so much.